All right, good afternoon, everybody. So you're just joining in. Um, I'd like you to welcome you all to the thesis defense of Alexis Long. Um, I'd also like to first acknowledge our committee members. Of course, Ms. Rosie, Rosie Ennis, um, who we all know very well, um, and Dr. Peggy Fong, who's at the University of California, Los Angeles, but is currently in Marea, a lucky dog. So, <laughs> so and it's eight o'clock in the morning, so we'll be respectful of her. Um, and make this snappy. Okay, so I just want to introduce Alexis. Um, Alexis is from Southern Maryland, and she received her Bachelor of Science in Biology from Norfolk State University in Virginia. Um, she came to UVI as part of the 2019 NMES cohort. Um, as part of the spring 2020 capstone project, she helped research stony coral tissue loss disease in the US Virgin Islands and contributed to the paper, Diversity and Disease, the Effects of Coral Diversity on Prevalence and Impacts of Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. And that was published actually in the Frontiers of Marine Science last year. Um, at UVI, she served as a research assistant in the Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program and interned with the Virgin Islands Marine Advisory Service Water Heroes Project. Um, she also is a Seas Islands Alliance graduate fellow and an NSF STEM scholarship recipient. Upon graduation from UVI, she hopes to get a position working in a STEM outreach and education prior to pursuing a doctoral degree. That all sounds great. So the way this is gonna go, um, Alexis will give her public presentation and then you, the audience, will have a chance to ask some questions of her um, regarding the presentation. And then um, the committee will con convene with um, Alexis privately. Um, and you guys will all go about your way. And then hopefully after that, everything will go well and Alexis will emerge as a master's candidate or a master's and waiting, I guess you would call it. But anyway, I don't wanna, without further ado, um, Alexis, I want you to take it away for your project titled Modern Rates of Herbivory and Low Nutrients Are Unable to Reduce Coral Overgrowth by the Crustos Red Alga Remicrusta Textilis at Flat Key, U.S. Virgin Islands. All right, Alexis. Thank you for that introduction, Tyler. Um, and with that, I'll get started. So coral reefs are beautiful, highly productive ecosystems that provide a variety of services, including nursery habitat for fish and other associated species, the basis for the tourism industry in many countries, carbon sequestration and fishing revenue that supports the livelihood of people in these coastal communities. However, over the past century, these systems have been negatively impacted by anthropogenic activity and reef health has, has experienced a sharp decline. In fact, the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network has estimated that 14% of global coral cover was lost from 2008 to 2019 alone. Marine debris, anchoring and dredging, thermal stress due to climate change, ocean acidification, sedimentation, and coral diseases are just some of the stressors that play a role in the decline of reef health. The compounded effects of these stressors affecting reefs are responsible for their shift from coral dominance to algal dominance. Negative impacts of these shifts include changes in habitat as coral cover declines and algae becomes more abundant, which causes biodiversity to decrease. This change in community composition results in trophic cascade shifts, alterations in fisheries, productivities, and disturbances in biotic interactions. In the past 20 years in the Caribbean, a new group of nuisance macroalgae has emerged. The Ramacrusta genus is a group of red crustose macroalgae that was first identified in the Indo-Pacific. Its presence was first reported in the Caribbean in 2009, um, and it has pretty variable morphology, tends to grow in shallow, clean water, and also is often observed overgrowing living and dead stony corals, octocorals, and other algae. As of right now, we're unsure if these algae are invasive or introduced species, or if they've always been here at low abundances and we're just now noticing them because they're expanding throughout the Caribbean. So like I said, Remacrusta widely vary in morphology, as you can see in the photos on this slide. The top left photo shows a Ramacrusta species growing in a solitary stand with fluted erect tissue. The bottom left shows Ramacrusta overgrowing fire coral and it has a dark red kind of burgundy color. And on the right, we have an image of Ramacrusta overgrowing a boulder star coral in the Orbicella genus. And it's orange in color, and you can see that it's laterally over extending, extending over the live coral tissue. So another thing I just wanted to point out is that though Ramacrusta are red calcifying algae, 
that may visibly remember, resemble crustose coralline algae or CCAs. They're not part of this group of algae. Um, another notable difference between the two is that CCAs are calcified all the way through, but Ramacrusta thalli tends to be heavily calcified in the basal layers and less so as you move more towards the apical layers. And they may not be calcified at all in the uppermost layers. Another distinguishing feature between the two is Ramacrusta's tendency to overgrow other benthic organisms, including stony corals. So in a study conducted in 2013 on the Dutch Caribbean island of Bonaire, researchers observed competitive interactions between a Ramacrusta species and corals in Lac Bay. Ramacrusta was observed overgrowing 12 species of stony corals. And here in the highlighted red box, you can see that 45.8% of the total surveyed colonies were being overgrown. The unidentified Ramacrusta species was later genetically sequenced and identified as Ramacrusta bonaerensis during the surveys. So similar results were seen in a 2015 study conducted by the Puerto Rico Department of Natural and Environmental Resources. Uh, Ramacrusta textilis was observed overgrowing 11 species of stony corals and just over half of the surveyed colonies were being overgrown. You can see in the red box that 50.2% of the surveyed colonies were being overgrown. So here we have data from those same two studies. And on the left, we see the results of benthic community surveys in Bonaire, where mean percent benthic cover of Ramacrusta was more than twice that of stony coral cover. In the red, we see Ramacrusta cover was 18.7, while stony coral cover was at 6.9. And on the right is the table showing mean percent benthic cover from the report in Puerto Rico, where again, Ramacrusta cover was more than twice that of stony coral benthic cover. And in the red, we see that Ramacrusta cover was 27.9% and stony coral cover was only 12.4. So in the US Virgin Islands, former MMES student Carly Hollister studied Ramacrusta as part of her, part of her master's thesis. Uh, on the right is a map of her study sites on the Southwest side of St. Thomas. She sequenced the DNA of the Ramacrusta species found at nine sites, which are Savannah Island, Buck Island, Fortuna Bay, Perseverance Bay, Water Island, Saba Island at Windward and Leeward sites, and Flat Key at Windward and Leeward sites. And she found that that species was Ramacrusta textilis. Environmental site data was also collected as part of Carly's study. Uh, her study found that benthic orbital velocity, which is a measure of wave energy, was strongly positively correlated with Ramacrusta textilis cover. So as benthic orbital velocity increased, so did Ramacrusta cover. This relationship is aligned with observations of high Ramacrusta cover in Lac Bay, as well as reports of pacinellid algal crusts in wave exposed areas in St. John. Uh, this information supports the notion that high Ramacrusta abundance is likely to be found in environments with a lot of water motion. Uh, there are lots of species of algae that grow well in intense wave environments, and tough crustose forms of algae in particular tend to be more resistant to stressful wave conditions than other kinds of algae. And this may be the case for Ramacrusta textilis as well. Carly's study also revealed some interesting information about species-specific coral interactions with Ramacrusta. This is a plot of mean linear Ramacrusta growth rates by site and substrate type. The letters on top of the bars indicate statistical significance, where bars that are not statistically different from one another have the same letters. This graph shows that Ramacrusta textilis grew significantly faster on Orbicella annularis than on any other substrate type. This suggests that this coral species might be highly susceptible to overgrowth. On the other hand, the slowest growth rates were observed on Sideroastria sideria, and this coral species was even able to reserve, reverse Ramacrusta overgrowth at the Fortuna Bay site, which is shown here in black. This is currently the only Caribbean coral species that's known to both resist and reverse Ramacrusta overgrowth. The Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program, or TCRIMP, assesses coral health, uh, benthic and fish community structure and physical dynamics at over 30 sites across the USVI. This program has been monitoring the spread of Ramacrusta. And after reviewing previous TCRIMP data, researchers realized that Ramacrusta textilis was detected in 2003 at Savannah Island. 
Prior to the 2005 mass bleaching event that affected the territory, Ramacrusta cover at Savannah was less than 10% and coral cover was about 20%. In 2008, coral cover had declined to about 10% and Ramacrusta cover had increased to nearly 50%. By 2016, Ramacrusta cover at Savannah had reached 60% and the alga was frequently observed overgrowing live coral. The initial loss in coral cover has been attributed to the mass bleaching event in 2005, but the lack of recovery in following years may be influenced by the increase in Ramacrusta cover. So as you can see from these rapid increases in abundance on Caribbean reefs, Ramacrusta has a potential to alter reef community composition and could play a large role in phase shifts from coral to algal dominance. One of the knowledge gaps surrounding this group of algae is the mechanisms that promote its expansion and complete overgrowth of living coral. So there's a well-established positive relationship between nutrient enrichment and primary production in estuaries, lagoons, and other kinds of aquatic systems. But in coral reefs, this concept is more disputed and controversial. In the past, limited nutrient availability may have prevented phase shifts by placing constraints on the amount of algal biomass that reefs can support. But since reefs are usually oligotrophic or low nutrient environments, external nutrient influxes, which are often occur as a result of anthropogenic activity like dredging and pollution, uh, these activities may be releasing reef algae from these bottom up constraints and promoting eutrophication and phase shifts. More research is necessary uh, on the relationship between nutrient enrichment and algae, especially crustose algae, in order to fully understand the impacts that increasing anthropogenic activity has on, their, on these systems. The impacts of herbivory on macroalgae are more widely accepted. Herbivores have been proven to reduce and control algal cover on reefs to prevent them from being overgrown, but the effects of this grazing pressure are different on algae with different morphologies. Herbivorous fish are more likely to graze on fleshy macroalgae and urchins tend to be the primary grazers on algae with crustose forms. There have been reported sightings of scrapes resembling parrotfish bites on the surface of Ramacrusta textilis and on reefs in Puerto Rico, which suggests that the alga might be unpalatable to the herbivorous fish in the Caribbean. The long spine sea urchin Diadema antillorum, which I'll be referring to as Diadema for the rest of this presentation, is a keystone herbivore in the Caribbean that experienced a major die-off in the 1980s. Urchin populations still haven't recovered and their incomplete recovery has released macroalgae from top-down controls. Diadema have been actively observed, have been observed actively grazing on Ramacrusta and were shown to be effective at reducing its cover on reefs in a study that was published earlier this year, but there's still a lack of information regarding diadema abundances that are necessary to reduce macroalgal cover on reefs. This information is really important for natural resource managers to be able to make decisions and implement strategies that will help reduce and reverse the effects of anthropogenic activity on reefs. So just to expand a little bit more on um, that study where diadema was found to effectively reduce cover on reefs. Here's a figure from that study, uh, Williams 2022 which was conducted in Puerto Rico. Each graph reports mean benthic cover inside of experimental corrals at a different site. So the site Calle Diablo is on the left and Los Lobos is on the right. The legend at the top indicates the sampling point and at the far right of both graphs is the percent cover of Ramacrusta. The black bars show initial Ramacrusta cover at the beginning of the experiment and the bars get lighter as you move to the right and indicate the passage of time. At Cayo Diablo on the left, Ramacrusta cover was reduced by an average of 46% at the end of the two month uh, experimental run and algal cover was reduced by 51% at Los Lobos on the right. Natural populations of diadema at this site, at these sites was less than 0.01 urchins per meter squared and corrals were stocked with a density of about 5.5 urchins per meter squared to achieve these Ramacrusta cover losses. So in summary, not much is known about why Ramacrusta is spreading so quickly or the mechanisms that allow it to overgrow living coral. It's possible that nutrient enrichment and a lack of adequate herbivory pressure were stimulating growth and expansion 
but more specifically, diadema grazing habits on Ramacresta should be further explored. Which brings us to the goals of my study, which are to fill some of these knowledge gaps. I had two objectives, the first of which was to determine if nutrient enrichment and or herbivory exclusion affect Ramacrusta textilis overgrowth rates of the staghorn coral Acropora cervicornis and a shallow offshore reef. And the null hypothesis is that, well, null hypotheses, I have three. The first is that there's no significant effect of nutrient enrichment on Ramacrusta overgrowth rates. The second is that there's no significant effect of herbivory exclusion on Ramacrusta overgrowth rates. And the final one is that there is no interaction between nutrient enrichment and herbivory exclusion on Ramacrusta overgrowth rates. My alternative hypothesis, or what I expected to see, was that there are significant positive relationships between both nutrient enrichment and nutrient re enrichment and Ramacrusta overgrowth rates and herbivory exclusion in Ramacrusta overgrowth rates. The second goal of my study was to determine diadema density required to suppress Ramacrusta cover on plots of the boulder star coral or Bacella annularis. And the null hypothesis is that there's no significant effect of diadema density on Ramacrusta cover on plots of Orbicella annularis. And my alternative hypothesis is that there's a significant negative effect of diadema density on Ramacrusta cover with greater algal cover loss as urchin density increases. So moving into the materials and methods, for the first experiment, a two-factor experiment was conducted to determine the effects of nutrient enrichment and herbivore exclusion on Ramacrusta textilis overgrowth of Acropora cervicornis fragments. All treatments were fully crossed with a total of 24 replicates and are listed here uh, in the table. So ambient nutrients and ambient herbivory, enriched nutrients and ambient herbivory, enriched nutrients, absent herbivory, and ambient nutrients, absent herbivory. In addition, to understand the possibility of caging artifacts on Ramacrusta odor overgrowth, four replicates were also established with incomplete cages as controls. We only explored caged artifacts for unenriched treatments because there's no reason to think that these would vary with enrichment. Uh, so incomplete cage controls were missing a side of galvanized wire, which left an open section that allowed herbivores access to the Ramacrusta Acropora unit. These controls were compared to the ambient nutrients and ambient herbivory treatment, and no significant difference was found between these two groups. So here's a map of the study sites from both experiments. On the top left, you'll see a broad view of the USVI in Puerto Rico, with the island of St. Thomas outlined in a red box. On the bottom left is the map zoomed in on St. Thomas with a red box used to indicate a small offshore key called flat key. And on the right, it shows a zoomed in uh, view of my experimental study sites relative to flat key. Uh, my study sites are shown in yellow boxes and the magenta box is the location where I harvested a cropper cervicornis fragments that were used in experiment one. You can see the thickets on the bottom of the ocean on the left side of that magenta box. These flat key sites were chosen because they're easily accessible, have high Ramacrusta abundance, um, as well as existing Acropora cervicornis thickets and Orbicella annularis colonies that were interacting with the Ramacrusta. And again, these sites were previously studied in Carly Hollister's 2021 study. So in selecting my coral fragments, branches of large colonies were chosen that had a ring of living Ramacrusta on the branch base and a minimum of one centimeter of Ramacrusta overgrowth. All fragments were about eight to 15 centimeters in length and they were harvested using 10 snips. Uh, they were placed into bins and collected in one dive and immediately transported to the experimental area on the Northwest side of Flat Key. Acropora cervicornis was chosen as the coral species to study because it appears non-susceptible to stony coral tissue loss disease, which has been affecting over 20 species of coral in the USVI since 2019. Uh, it's also an important restoration species that'll have to compete with Ramacrusta since they prefer the same shallow, turbulent environments. So in establishing the plots, divers haphazardly selected patches of 
calcium carbonate to attach the experimental Rammer Crusta Acropora units. Fragments were cable tied to masonry nails that were driven partially into the benthos, and then they were further secured using epoxy. Uh, each fragment was then tagged with a livestock ear tag um, on an adjacent masonry nail for identification purposes. Experimental units were allowed to acclimate in the new environment for a week. And then at the end of the acclimation period, an additional two to four masonry nails were placed around each Acropora unit, ram across the Acropora unit, to act as anchors for cages and nutrient diffusers, as well as to serve as a reference point for photographs. So all of my cages were made from half inch galvanized wire with a 20 centimeter diameter base and an approximate height of about 40 centimeters. Uh, they were attached to the benthos using the nails that were surrounding the replicates and the herbiv herbivory exclusion treatments. And they were cable tied to these nails. Nutrient enrichment plots had a single nylon bag containing 45 grams of 14, 14, 14 Osmocote slow release fertilizer cable tied to them. In the enriched plots with ambient herbivory or no cage, the nylon bag was secured to an adjacent masonry nail. And in the enriched plots where herbivores were excluded or there was a cage present, nylon bags were attached to the cages. So Ramacruster growth was measured as the linear extension of the thallus margin along the Acropora tissue fragments. These measurements were obtained from photos and all photos were taken from between two and four angles as indicated by the masonry nails around the plots uh, to provide a more complete encapsulation of the Ramacrusta Acropora interaction margin. Photos were taken at the start of the experiment in February and then monthly until June, 2021. And an item of known length was placed in each photo to be used as a scale uh, while taking measurements. So photos of each unit from each angle were imported into ImageJ and algal overgrowth was measured through a series of steps that were taken in the program. A line selection was made on the object of known length, as you can see in the picture on the left here, which was a washer, um, to define the spatial scale of the active image. And then another line selection was made from the active growth margin of Ramacrusta to the bottom of the Acropora cervicornis fragment and measured to obtain the linear overgrowth value. This process was repeated for every photo from every angle. The overgrowth measurements at each angle were averaged to provide a single value for each Ramacrusta Acropora unit. Subtraction was then used to measure growth between sampling periods, and this value was divided by the number of days between sampling periods to produce an average growth rate per day using the equation that you can see here. So moving into the second experiment, as a reminder, the purpose of this experiment is to determine the effects of diadema density on Ramacrusta cover as the alga overgrows the star coral Orbicella annularis. Uh, 20 plots of about 0.16 meters squared were established on living Orbicella annularis colonies that were being overgrown by Ramacrusta. 15 different experimental densities of diadema were caged into the plots for 12 days and five open control plots were also established with no cages to determine if there were any effects of caging artifacts. So Orbicella annularis was chosen because of abundant in-site interactions between this species and Ramacrusta textilis. It was also chosen because it's only moderately susceptible to stony coral tissue loss disease in the US Virgin Islands. And after roving surveys by divers at the Experiment 2 study site, no corals with active disease lesions were found. All diadema were connected on, collected on snorkel under the Marine Science Center dock at the University of the Virgin Islands. Diadema with a minimum test diameter of 10 centimeters were chosen and placed in a bin filled with seawater. They were immediately transported to the study site using a boat and placed in the plots as they were established. So patches of Orbicella annularis with a minimum of about 30% Ramacrusta textilis cover were haphazardly selected by divers and tagged. Masonry nails were hammered into the substrate around the edges of each plot as points of attachment for the cages, as well as to outline and identify the plot perimeter. 
Overhead photos of each plot were taken with an item of known length, such as a ruler, an identification tag, something of that sort, placed in each photo as a size reference when taking measurements. Photos were imported into ImageJ, and the item of known length was used to create a scale on each image using line selection tools. Then the perimeter of each plot was outlined and measured. The perimeter was outlined in the area of the plot was measured. And areas of Ramacrusta overgrowth within the plot were also outlined and measured and summed for each photo to provide a single value for each experimental unit. Ramacrusta textilis cover was calculated by dividing the areas of Ramacrusta textilis by the total plot area. For experiment one, a linear mixed effects model was run and the fixed factors were herbivory, nutrients, and time with replicate being the random factor. And the response variable was Ramacrusta textilis growth rates from February to May of 2021. For the second experiment, linear and quadratic regressions were run on the relationship between diadema density and the absolute percent change in Ramacrusta cover. Absolute percent change was calculated for each replicate by subtracting algal percent cover at time point two from algal percent cover at time point one. This value was then divided by the 12 days of the experimental duration to obtain absolute percent loss of Ramacrusta cover per day. This metric was chosen because it represents the relative magnitude of cover loss compared to the initial conditions. And it also can be used to compare change in plots of different sizes. I also ran an unpaired t-test on absolute percent loss in Ramatextilis cover in the zero urchins per meter day plots and the open control plots. And we'll circle back to why this was relevant as we move into the results. So beginning with experiment one, here's a figure displaying Ramacrusta overgrowth rates across the sampling period of February to May. Error bars represent standard error of the mean. We have time intervals on the x-axis and the algal growth rate on the y-axis in millimeters per day. In the legend on the right, the C minus N minus treatment represents the uncaged or ambient herbivory and unenriched group. Uh, C minus N plus represents the uncaged and enriched group. C plus N minus represents the caged or absent herbivory and unenriched group and C plus N plus represents the caged and enriched group. P values of the fixed factors are in the red box on the left, and they are all greater than the alpha level of 0 0.05, which indicates that the linear, the linear mixed effects model showed no significant effects of nutrient enrichment, herbivory, nor the interaction between the two terms on Ramacrusta textilis overgrowth rates. So though there were no significant treatment effects, this experiment was able to successfully measure algal growth over each interval of the experiment. Um, it's just that all treatments grew indiscriminately regardless of herbivory or nutrient treatment. When all treatments are pooled, the mean growth rate is 0 0.07 millimeters per day. The fastest overgrowth rates from each treatment were observed from March to April, 2021. And they range from 0.115 to 0.184 millimeters per day. You can also see that the growth rates from February to March are extremely similar to the growth rates from April to May, which is pretty interesting. So moving into experiment two, three of the five zero urchins per meter squared plots lost tags or cages, and they were unable to be sampled at the second data collection point. So since these replicates were lost and there were only two replicates left in the zero urchins per meter squared plots, there wasn't sufficient power to detect significant changes in Ramacrusta cover. I ran a t-test to determine if absolute percent cover change per day was significantly different between the zero urchins per meter squared plots and the open control plots with no cages. Since there was no significant difference in these two, they were pulled into the lowest herbivory treatment for the following linear and quadratic regressions. In addition, uh, Carly Hollister's 2021 study surveyed diadema populations at this site and measured ambient diadema density to be 0.04 urchins per meter squared, which is extremely low and almost at zero. So, so as we continue to move towards the results for experiment two, 
You'll also notice on the graphs that diadema densities on the x-axis are not integers. This is due to the rugosity of the substrate and the need to conform the cages to the surface of the Orbicella annularis plots. So this complexity caused variation in surface area that was covered by the cages. And as a result, urchin density wasn't equal in each free plan density level. So mean plot area was 0.158 and the plot areas range from 0 0.101 to 0 0.244 meters squared. So here we have a figure showing diadema density on the x-axis and percent loss of Remicrusta textilis cover per day on the y-axis. The red line represents the prediction line based on the linear regression model. And P and R squared values are shown in the red box to the right of the plot. The p-value of 0 0.0399 indicates a significant positive relationship between diadema density and percent loss and Remicrusta cover per day. The R squared value which indicates how much of the variation in my data is explained by the independent variable is 0 0.1705, which tells us that this regression accounts for about 17% of the variance. In this figure, we have the same X and Y axes with diadema density on the X and percent loss in Ramacrusta cover per day on the Y. The red line here represents the prediction line based on the quadratic regression model. And again, P and R squared values are located to the right of the plot. And they indicate a significant quadratic relationship between diadema density and percent loss in Ramacrusta cover per day. Though both regressions were significant, the quadratic model fits better than the linear, uh, which we see if we compare the R squared values. Uh, here on the, quad the quadratic regression, the uh, R squared value tells us that almost 31% of the data is explained by the regression line. I do want to point out that regardless of the model, linear or quadratic, once diadema density reached about 4.1 urchins per meter squared, which you can see is circled in the little black circle here on the plot, uh, there wasn't much change in the amount of Ramacrusta percent loss per day, which means that the rate of algal cover loss stayed relatively constant even when urchin density was increased past 4.1 urchins. So now moving on to the discussions. The major findings of this study were that Ramacrusta textilis is not controlled by nutrient enrichment nor herbivory pressure, which presents a pretty dramatic contrast from the findings of many other studies that have found that both of these factors are known to limit algal growth and biomass accumulation on reefs. And finally, I found that diadema can significantly reduce Ramacrusta cover on live coral substrate, but this effect is density dependent. So I'm gonna break down each of these, starting with the lack of an effect of nutrient enrichment on Ramacrusta growth rates. So since Ramacrusta growth rates were not impacted by nutrient enrichment in the study, we suspect that the alga might be nutrient replete at the flat key study site. It's a shallow high energy environment with turbulence and high advection that could potentially be leading to high nutrient delivery to the algal communities. As a result, if Ramacrusta textilis is nutrient replete in turbulent environments, that means that additional nutrient supply from either natural or anthropogenic sources isn't really likely to increase the growth rate of the alga, as indicated by this figure with turbulent water, nutrient enrichment, and yet the growth rate remains the same. This also means that Ramacrusta textilis growth could potentially be stimulated in low energy environments where nutrients may not be delivered into the system by water turbulence. So it's possible that the addition of anthropogenic nutrients could enable Ramacrusta textilis to settle, grow, compete with other benthic organisms and environments that were previously thought to be unsuitable because of the low wave energy. Another possibility is that Ramacrusta textilis is nutrient replete at the competition border with coral. This could be true if algal overgrowth causes coral tissue death and remineralization, where the released nutrients would stimulate algal growth. In the Hollister et al. 2021 study, she found that the growth of Ramacrusta textilis margins was often faster when it was overtopping live coral tissue than on carbonate substrate without coral tissue. She observed algal growth rates on Orbicella annularis that were up to 2.6 times faster than those on bare substrate. 
This could suggest enhanced growth of Rama Crusta through competition with coral that might be explained by nutrient release. This possibility wasn't tested in this study because it was outside the bounds, but it could further be explored through another nutrient enrichment experiment. The maximum growth rate observed in the unenriched and uncaged treatment group, or the ambient Ramacrusta textilis overgrowth group, was 0.14 millimeters per day. And this rate is similar to the 0.13 millimeters a day maximum growth rate that's observed in the CCA Paragoniolithum, which is now Neophylum conicum, um, as reported by Mastuda in 1989. It's also one of the fastest reported growth rates of Acrestos alga. One of the major differences between these two species, however, is that the P. conicum growth rates were measured as the alga grew across a non-living substrate, while Ramacrusta textilis managed to reach similar growth rates while in competition with living coral. So in addition to differences in color and calcification, rapid growth rates present yet another criteria that can be used to distinguish Ramacrusta from other CCAs. And it further emphasizes how unique and kind of odd this alga is. So moving into the lack of effect of herbivory on Ramacrusta growth rates, I wanna draw attention to a couple of facts regarding the current status of herbivores at Flat Key and throughout the Caribbean. So the highest recorded parrotfish biomass measurement in the Caribbean is 70, 71 grams per meter squared. And that's more than four times that of the total herbivorous biomass, herbivorous fish biomass reported by Carly Hollister study on the leeward side of Flat Key, which is the location of experiment one. Um, and that biomass was 16.34, excuse me. The reported diadema density at uh, this site was also 0.563 urchins per meter squared, which is far below the minimum density of about five urchins per meter squared that was required to significantly reduce Ramacrusta cover on reefs in Puerto Rico. Um, and that data is from the Williams 2022 study. So these findings suggest that diadema could potentially control Ramacrusta cover, but urchin density was just too low to see an effect in the context of experiment one. And the same may be true for the herbivorous fish populations. Um, though it's possible that herbivorous fish could help control Ramacrusta, we still aren't sure to what extent uh, they graze on Ramacrusta, if at all. So for now, it appears that there's little ecological redundancy for the control of this alga. In experiment two, even though there was a significant relationship found between urchin density and percent cover loss per day of Ramacrusta, on the windward side of Flat Key, a minimum diadema density of 4.1 urchins per meter squared was necessary for this loss, necessary to achieve this loss. The current diadema density at this site is even lower than that in the experiment one study area at 0.043 urchins per meter squared. And again, this value is much lower than the density required to reduce Ramacrusta cover at this site. So the lack of an effect of ambient herbivory on Ramacrusta textilis is an interesting find that could potentially shed some light on its native range. So if it's an introduced species that originated in the Pacific, the lack of control by herbivores could be predicted by the enemy release hypothesis, which was proposed in a 2019 study by Middleton. Uh, this theory states that invasive species are less affected by herbivory and more successful in new geographic locations because they're released from control by their natural herbivores while the native species there are not. Another possibility is that Ramacrusta could also be a native alga that's exhibiting a delayed response to the diadema die-off in the 1980s and the overfishing of reef herbivores in recent decades. Whether the species is native or introduced, however, uh, Ramacrusta is drastically altering the benthic composition of reefs in the U.S. Virgin Islands and should be further studied to identify the factors that facilitated success. This study provides some further context and evidence for the high competitive capacity of Ramacrusta. Since Ramacrusta textilis wasn't nutrient limited in the high wave energy environments of these experiments and since herbivory is not sufficient to control its growth, this means that corals are left to compete with an alga that grows at a high linear rate 
with minimal top-down control. Previous studies uh, have demonstrated that many coral species are susceptible to overgrowth by Ramacrusta, and most haven't demonstrated the ability to resist or reverse the alga. So Carly Hollister's study, again, found that algal growth rates on Orbicella annularis were 2.6 times faster than that of control plots, um, which I mentioned a bit earlier when talking about nutrient enrichment. And of the five coral species that she studied, which were Orbicella annularis, Orbicella fabulata, Parides astroides, Pseudodeploria Pseudo stragosa, and Sideroastria sidorea, the Sideroastria species is the only one that is that was effectively able to inhibit algal overgrowth. This finding presents natural resource managers with limited options for controlling this alga in the USVI with restoring diadema populations likely being the most beneficial. The short duration of my study poses some limitations since seasonal variation in coral growth and competitive capacity were not accounted for. So both experiments in this study should be repeated for longer periods of time, um, at least a year for experiment one to fully capture changes in algal growth and competition uh, in both Ramacrusta and Acropora. And experiment two should be repeated for at least two months with higher and more even replication, replication of diadema, diadema densities. Uh, in addition, Ramacrusta growth rates peaked between March and April of 2021 and the reason for this increase is unknown. Uh, so seasonal changes in their impact would be a really interesting area of study, which leads us into the future research. Hi, so cool. Right, yeah. Coral reefs worldwide are at risk of shifting to macroalgal dominance. And Ramacrusta has emerged as an algal species of interest in the Caribbean due to its high competitive capacity. So this study has provided useful information regarding the environmental conditions that are favorable for the spread of this alga and its rapid overgrowth rates, substrate colonization capacity, and apparent resistance to ambient herbivory are factors that are likely contributing to its success. So future research should again examine Ramacrusta growth rates for a full year to capture the effects of seasonality, examine algal growth rates on both biotic and abiotic substrate, to identify competition mechanisms and observe Ramacrusta growth in varying wave climates while monitoring nutrient concentrations to shed further light on its nutrient sources and growth patterns. So with that, I'll head into my acknowledgements and there are lots of people and organizations who I'd like to thank you for assisting with this project, beginning with my advisor, Dr. Tyler Smith, for just taking the time to teach me and help make me into a better researcher, um, as well as my committee members, Peggy, Dr. Peggy Fong and Rosman Ennis for helping me design this project and just really bring it to life, as well as assisting in data analyses and writing with the manuscript. Um, I'd like to thank the UVI MMES program and staff for supporting me through this process, as well as for funding assistance through the NSF STEM scholarship. I wanna acknowledge the Lana Vento Charitable Trust the Virgin Islands Department of Planning and Natural Resources and the Seas Islands Alliance for funding assistance throughout my time as a graduate student. Um, I'd also like to thank the 2019 MMES cohort, um, especially Kelsey Vaughn, Kayla Budd, Madison Miller, and the late Stephanie Hibberts for all of their support and assistance, as well as Nicole Krampitz, Reagan Mason, Amber Packard, Sonora um, for all of your help in the field. Um, I wanna give special thanks to Angelisa Freeman and Shaniqua Simmons for getting sliced up by chicken wire with me and helping me build my cages. I wanna express my appreciation to Dr. Caitlin Fong for her wisdom with statistics and just navigating the demands of grad school and scientific writing. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Paul Barber for his advice and encouragement. I want to thank my family, my parents, Jasper and Shelly Long, my brother, Alexander Long, for supporting me, not just through this program, but through everything that I do. Um, and finally, I just want to thank Ileana Fenwick and Austin Betancourt for just being awesome research partners and writing buddies, as well as friends. So thank you all.
And here are my references. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Alexis. Yeah, right now we just open it up to questions from anyone. Um, you can either raise your hand if you're in the, I guess we're all in the chat um, and I can try and call on you. Yeah, Teresa, you have a question? Um, I actually had two questions. First, um, it was very exciting to see this stuff. Um, so Alexis, um, did you check or see anything about whether the Ramicrusta was uh, reproductive at all? I did not. Um, I was more so just measuring its growth uh -huh. and extension, but that is interesting as well. You know me, tetra, is it a tetrasporophyte or a gametophyte? <laughs> Big question. The other question I had was, there was a student of Tyler's named Tanya Ramsayar um, who did a thesis on Dictyota where she put out osmocot coat um, uh, fertilizer. Um, are you familiar with that one? Yes, I am. So I was curious um, how you put together in your mind, her results with your results, because you did a similar methods. Uh, well, I'm more so familiar with her experimental like methodology, because uh -huh. I use it kind of as a branching off point more so than her actual results of her study, so. So, so she actually found something kind of similar in the sense that the, um, she was expecting putting nutrients out would make Dictio to grow more. Mm -hmm. But in fact, um, it didn't. So she was saying it was nutrient uh, replete or, um, uh, you know, maybe there's something even wrong with that osmocote uh, method because she was actually seeing sometimes uh, you put out a nutrient and the, the, the algae would do worse. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you might uh, go back, and, so you probably read it when you were designing, go back and look at it and think about um, um, it's, you know, different sites and different depths and a lot of differences, but um, also uh, showing a, a nutrient replete um situation maybe okay great yeah i'll go back and check it thank you Teresa. um this osmocote is pretty widely used in uh enrichment experiments so i'm not sure if it's the osmocote or if these sites around st thomas are really just all very nutrient dense um in addition, like on the cages and around the replicates that were nutrient enriched, I noted a lot of epiphytes. Uh, so we kind of took that as a, yes, the nutrient enrichment plots are being enriched. Great, thank you. Um, Ileana Fenwick, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, well, first and foremost, I'd like to congratulate you on an excellent presentation. This was so informative, uh, lovely to see today. I wanted to know how you see either this research or even just what you've learned from this project and how that may translate into some of the work you'll do in the future. Uh, thank you, first off, and great question. Um, I really like algae in general. Um, and Ramacrusta is definitely unique uh, from the morphology to its rapid growth rates and overgrowing uh, living benthic organisms. So it's definitely something that I'd like to study in the future. Um, I'm really interested in learning about its origins. Uh, has it always been in the Caribbean? Did it indeed originate in the Indo-Pacific? Um, and how does that play a role into the lack of an effect of herbivory on it. Um, 
So that is something that I'd like to revisit at some point and hopefully I'll be lucky enough to be able to do so. Thank you. I can't wait to see what's next. Hi, I'm Herbert Quintero. You have a question? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Alexis, and congratulations. Nice presentation. Uh, my question is just if you are aware of any efforts to reproduce um, diadema antilaron in Puerto Rico or here in the USD, the USD, USDI. Uh, I believe there are, thank you also for the presentation, but um, I believe there are diadema restoration efforts underway. Um, I'm not super sure of how they're going in Puerto Rico, but I also know anecdotally that there have been reports of diadema dying off still, or, you know, just dead ones washing up, uh, sick ones down there. So it's Definitely vital to figure out what's going on as we continue with these restoration efforts. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's great. I don't see any further questions. Um, if there's nothing further, then I'll just say thanks to everyone for attending. And we're gonna now retire for, um, with the committee. Um, with Alexis to discuss the thesis itself. Um, so if everyone would just kind of hang up and hang out um, or go about your way. Um, thank you very much for attending. Great job, Alexis.